Okay, good. <clears throat> Hello folks, um, looks like my video's frozen with me making a strange face here. I'll uh, try to get that fixed up for you. But we'll, um, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're um, experiencing some technical difficulties. Uh, but I assume you can hear me. Welcome to the next installment of Mesa Talks. Uh, I'll be uh, introducing our speaker here in a moment. The Mesa Talks lecture series, for those of you who don't know, is a partnership between the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project and Los Luceros Historic Site. So we want to thank our friends at Los Luceros for all their hard work in uh, organizing the Mesa Talks of this year. And uh, we look forward to actually seeing you folks live in person. That's right. We expect to start doing the Mesa Talks in person starting uh, possibly as early as the August installment. So look out for announcements for those. For those of you who are tuning in at a distance or simply can't make it in, please don't worry. We will still be bringing you the live streams of the Mesa Talks uh, just like this. So uh, you'll be able to see the live streams here on uh, Facebook Live, and as always, we will also be uploading these to our YouTube channel afterwards. So uh, you can find them here, you can find the replays here, you can find the replays uploaded on YouTube, but you will also be able to attend in person, and that's actually really exciting for everyone. So we look forward to seeing you there. So without further ado, I'm uh, joined today by our speaker, Candy Bordoon, who will be uh, talking about the uh, best of the best in petroglyph recording at Mesa Prieta for the year 2020. So, hello, Candy. Hi, Chester. It's good to hear your voice. All right. So, um, yeah, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to start this screen share, and we'll start our program. <clears throat> so I am really delighted to be joining all of you to give this presentation this year. I would rather be giving it in person, but hopefully by next year we will be able to do that. Um, we're talking today about um, the images that our teams have recorded uh, during COVID, the best of the best for 2020. And this is a selection of the most outstanding archaeological features, and not only outstanding, but unique and interesting. So um, with COVID, uh, the, the project, as Chester explained, essentially shut down in about April. All activities and all volunteers ceased any activity on the Mesa. And just now, as he said, we're beginning to open up. We are giving a few tours that are scheduled. And in August, hopefully things begin to really open up. Um, but last year, by spring of 2020, a number of our very impatient petroglyph recorders were inquiring whether they could return to the field if all precautions were observed. <clears throat> and some teams did, not all of them, but some did. Um, they, they observed precautions by driving alone in individual vehicles from Santa Fe, Taos, Los Alamos, and Las Lunas. They wore masks in the field, gloves when handling equipment, used hand sanitizer, and socially distanced. And that works well um, generally when you're recording, but there are times that the team needs to be close together. And so these, the observation of these um, precautions was um, justified. In spite of COVID, an amazing amount of field work was completed in 2020, and this presentation shares with you what was found. 
So what I'm going to be showing you um, are the highlights. Uh, we had we brought we recorded 624 individual boulders, <coughs> and I'm going to be showing you the highlights of eight and a half percent of those. On those boulders, there were a little over 2,000 individual elements, such as this. Um, for a possible axe head on this uh, boulder on, the, on this slide. We had 63 outstanding panels, and those are um, identified by the recorders uh, as outstanding panels. Um, the nomenclature is an S7 in our categorization sheet, and generally the way this um, is applied to a boulder is a recorder will walk up and say, oh, wow. And you know from there that this is something unusual or something particularly special. Our recorders took 921 photos, <clears throat> which means we processed 921 photos to go into our database. We recorded 85 acres on the Cook family property and 18 acres on other parcels of private land. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about them, how the Mesa was made. This slide is courtesy of Kurt Kempner, a very well-known geologist um, who happens to live in New Mexico. Um, when I saw this, I was delighted because for years I've been trying to explain to our recorders how this mesa was made. How did that bed of lava, 50 or 60 feet or 100 feet thick, end up at the top of a mesa? And, what, and this slide demonstrates <clears throat> exactly what happened. So three million years ago, a fissure um, up towards uh, the Colorado border um, emitted a vast quantity of lava and it, it flowed down what was then a valley. The Rio Grande was not in this valley, but it was a valley with some erosional purposes. And so the 100 foot thickness of lava flowed down this valley, cooled and hardened. And then over the next three million years, erosion <coughs> started pulling down the soil on both sides of that valley and kind of equalized the height of the, of the basalt with the surrounding area. And then as time continued, the, the basalt did not move, but erosion removed so much sediment on both sides of the mesa that now the, <clears throat> excuse me, the lava is now 1,000 feet above the valley floor. And right in here is where the Rio Grande runs. And on the other side, the um, Rio del, uh, sorry, the Rio del Ojo Caliente runs on the east side. So from here, we have lost a thousand feet of alluvial uh, debris to bring this mesa looking like it, it towers over the valley, which it does. Um, and that will help you to understand how that may was made. We know that human usage goes back over 7,500 years and uh, we're constantly looking for evidence that it goes um, further. So here is the mesa today. Um, here is that basalt layer that's at 60 to 100 feet thick. Um, it's sort of in a canoe shape. Um, and uh, one of our recorders just happened to be in a plane flying over it and provided this wonderful photo. You can see how steep this is the west side, west northwest side is very, very steep and very, very rugged. Um, we work primarily on the east side. Um, it's not as steep. There are very nice um, shelves uh, as, the, as the lava has peeled off. That's left um, nice shelves where, uh, pet, where boulders have um, become stationary and petroglyphs have been uh, applied. Uh, the, the project was started in 1999 by our founder, Catherine Wells. Um, the re petroglyph recording formally started in 2002. To date, we have recorded well over 70,000 petroglyphs, and we anticipate formally that there are over 100,000 images on the Mesa, and I think that is wrong. I think we're going to see that escalate by 10,000 every couple of years. There are a lot of images on this Mesa that we are continuing to discover. We are the largest petroglyph site in New Mexico, and there are some very large petroglyph sites in New Mexico with three rivers, the Petroglyph National Monument and Alamo Mountain down south, um, but we are the largest site in New Mexico. We want to give thanks to the Richard Cook family who gave us permission in 2009 to record on their land and other private landowners on Mesa Prieta. 
And I want to say that in the beginning, it was very, very hard to get private landowners, small private landowners, to give us permission to record their land. But little by little, um, we are earning their trust. We provide them with a very, very nice archaeological record and landowners report that they share with other landowners. And now um, we don't have enough teams to keep up uh, with the private land that we have permission to record. But we want to thank these folks for allowing us to record the petroglyphs and archaeological features on their land. Right now, we have about 25 adult volunteers who record in eight teams on the Mesa. We have five recording teams recording on two parcels of the Richard Cook property. Two other teams are working on some of those separate small private parcels. And we have one survey team called the Rock Art Trekkers. They like to call themselves the Rats, and they work as assigned. The adult volunteer teams undergo a minimum of five days of classroom and field training prior to be, being assigned to a recording team on the Mesa. Uh, we realize that the quality of data that comes in from the field is going to be reflected in our database. And if we don't get good quality from the field through training, um, our database is going to suffer. Volunteers commit to recording one day a month for a minimum of one year, and most teams are right on. We have this particular team here on the left uh, records every week or every other week, weather permitting. There is nothing else they'd be rather doing. Several volunteers have been with the project for 19 years or more, and this work would not be possible but without our recording and survey volunteers. So this is a topical view of the Mesa, and it's broken up showing the landowners, um, land management and landowners. This is the top of the Mesa, and this is privately owned. Um, most of the petroglyphs are on the east side, the north and the east side, around the tip to the southwest. Uh, we have recorded a little bit on the west, um, but as I said, that's a very steep, difficult place to access, but there are a lot of petroglyphs over there. The green at the north shows the BLM property, and that actually extends right across the Mesa from point to point. And um, the summer youth program worked there for, I think from 2002 till about um, 2010 and um, recorded a huge amount of material. Um, the Cook property, Cook family property is this large pink area. This represents 4,000 acres of property. This property down here that's kind of ochre is also in the Cook family. Um, we put it, we name it Cochrane because that was the previous owner. This is 2,800 acres. Um, the Wells Preserve is right here. It kind of is dwarfed by these other properties um, at 188 acres. Um, this is a private piece of private land of 225 acres of Salazar property that was the first one we recorded in 2002. And due to a lot of technical difficulties, we're re recording part of it now. Um, the Ancone block is made up of about 20 small parcels, anywhere from two acres to 30 acres. And we have recorded just about all of these parcels, 30 parcels. Uh, we have two or three more that we'd like to get permission to do, but we're patient. And then this red down here is the current El Huique mine owned by the Cook family. Um, we, in the past, have recorded right in front of the mine work um, coming up around here. We have recorded an interior to the mine where we, we knew there were archeological features and the landowners were very, very supportive of us doing that. Um, right now our teams are finishing, um, the mine is expanding and we have teams working again right in front of the mine work uh, recording um, what eventually will be mined so that we do have a archaeological record of that. <clears throat> the summer youth intern program uh, has existed every summer since 2002. Um, youth age 13 to 18 apply for now with COVID, just six openings. In the past, it has been at least a dozen or more. They are trained to record petroglyphs and other archaeological features in the same manner as the adult recorders have done. The youth work on the Cook property down here for two weeks every June, overseen by the project archaeologist, Chester Lawash, and adult volunteers. Um, summer youth is STEM-based. The youth acquired skills that contribute to employment and advanced education. 
The last day of their program uh, is spent doing data entry into a computer. Um, so they are learning some very sophisticated skills. Um, this, this is uh, pictures from, I think, two years ago of the kids working in the field. Um, this is Allison Youngs, who's one of our recorders that we can't keep off of the Mesa. She's out there every day. And uh, you can see the terrain, and you'll see a lot of this terrain as we continue. It's challenging. These kids are wonderful. Um, I'm going to start out um, going from the oldest images to the most recent. And I'm going to start out right now um, with the archaic cultural period that goes back to 7500 uh, BCE before the Common Era through 600 Common Era. It's a long time ago. And um, to describe who these people were, they were people that were migratory, they were hunters and gatherers who moved in mobile bands through this area foraging for wild plants and hunting <clears throat> game animals. The images they made are very deeply picked. They're heavily or totally repatinated, meaning that the patina on the rock has almost totally returned. They're very, very difficult to see. Um, the best time to see them is um, early in the morning, um, late in the afternoon, and in the winter time when a shadow might be cast across these very deeply pecked images. They are called non-representational, and I'll talk to that a little bit. Usually they're placed on the top or the north side of the boulders, not always. Um, the types of images that they, that they made include abstract and geometric images. For example, one pole ladders, which I'll show you, tridents, asterisks, curvilinear meanders, joined diamonds or triangles, and other geometric images. Many are extremely abstract, perhaps were made by a person or shaman in a dreamlike ceremonial or hallucinogenic trance. This should be ceremonial person. We don't use shaman anymore, Chester. Um, images placed in the later archaic period include human footprints and handprints and animal tracks. And archaic images are the oldest images recognized at present on the Mesa. We do not know what the Paleo-Indian images look like, but are researching and always looking. So this is an example of a one-fold ladder. Uh, you can see I put the drawing in over here so that you can you could see it more clearly. As you can see, they're very, very hard to see. This one is made harder because it's infilled with black lichen also. So it's, uh, it's really, really easy for the um, inexperienced eye to just not be able to see this. Um, these are uh, spirals and concentric circles. And this one in the lower right is, is a circle. I put a drawing in of it, but you can barely see that there. It's also not very deep. So it's really to the credit of these recorders that they saw this and recorded it. Uh, the one on the left side is a spiral, and it's, it's quite a bit easier to see, but still it would be, you know, for an eye just glancing over a rock, it would be very easy to miss. Very, very lovely. And this one up here is concentric circles, and you can see the advantage of side light being cast across that very, very deeply pecked image. You can see that there's a little bit of shadow on the lip of these peckings. And which, which gives us a little bit better chance of seeing and then recording those images. Then um, in the later archaic, and this would probably be about um, around the 5600 BCE, excuse me, um, the late archaic, we begin to see footprints. We see human footprints, and this, this amazing footprint um, is on a, a rather small boulder. It almost completely fills the boulder. You can see how articulated and carefully made these toes are. This is not fully repatinated. The patina has not completely returned to the original patina of the boulder, but it's on its way. The ancestral Pueblo cultural period um, starts in about 600 uh, CE, common area, and extends to 1598. And that date is when the Spanish came to this area, to the south end of the Mesa, which I'll talk about later. Um, the biggest evidence of people moving from the archaic to the ancestral Pueblo cultural period is that people began to cultivate 
some of the plants needed for food and personal medicinal, medicinal use. Prior to that, the hunter-gatherers were always searching um, for these items that they needed to sustain themselves. So this, this 600 CE is not a fixed number. Um, even in New Mexico, um, corn has been found in a cave uh, down by Albuquerque, and that was closer to the, to the turn of the century. So this is a very fluid number, but it depends on what the people are doing culturally. About 1200 CE, the ancestral Tewa people came from the Four Corners area. They are, they are the ancestors of the Tewa speaking people who live here today. The images they made were largely representational. Remember the archaic or non-representational. These are images that we could identify in today's world. And they include mythological one and two horned serpents, water beings, spirals, circles, discs, concentric circles, anthropomorphic figures or human figures, ceremonial objects, shields, stars, flute players, animals, birds, dancers, ceremonial figures, etc. They're fantastic. So here again, we see um, concentric circles, nucleated circles, but look at how light the patina is on these. These just really jump out of the rock when, when, it, when the recorders are surveying um, their proveniences. This one is very bright, and I wouldn't be surprised if this was made more in the post-contact period because it's so bright, there's very little uh, heavy patina on it. Look how nicely this one is. Um, it's a nucleated circle, and it actually has the nucleus situated inside kind of a dent, natural dent in the rock, beautifully made, purposefully made image. And then over here, we have a bisected concentric circle that's accompanied by two human hands. Um, this one uh, was recorded uh, just um, near the El Huique mine by uh, Linda, Ray, Allison, and Lynn. A very, very lovely serpent figure that follows the, the, the rock almost edge to edge. These are two-horned serpents or awanus. These are mythological fi figures and they represent water in the Tewa culture and in many cultures. Um, they're found all over the Southwest and down into Mexico. This one is probably the most easy to see and the most beautifully made. You can see that he has a rounded head and the two horns extend upwards. Very, very nicely made. Very often and most often, these snakes or serpents and or serpents will emerge from a crack from the edge of a rock or from a hole in the rock. And uh, I think I have some examples to show you concerning that. This one is a little bit um, less carefully made, but you can see that it has the two horns, the serpentine body. The same with this one, it's a little bit brighter. And this one is a very long one. This board is 30 centimeters high. And so this two horned serpent extends from this edge of the rock and he comes all the way down and actually leaves the picture. So you can see that this, this um, serpent is probably almost two meters long, meter and a half long. And then this one is quite a bit larger, darker I mean, but look at the horns and look at how, how far extended they are to almost a full like a circle. And then the serpentine body, it goes by a natural hole and then extends over to the edge of the rock. They're lovely, lovely images. The one horned serpent, which is also called an avanu, it's not as commonly found as the two-horned serpents. Um, this one is actually on a boulder with two uh, two two-horned serpents, um, but he, he's a very carefully, even though he's not fully infilled with pecking, he's very, very carefully and delicately made. We probably find a one-horned serpent one time as often as we do the two horns. So it's a one to 10 ratio roughly. Then um, in this time period, um, we have a lot of anthropomorphs. Um, we have, this one is very, very heavily picked, um, has no gender apparent, uh, only has a one hand, but it has a very, very large hand. And we've been told by various Native Americans, this could be a symbol of water, could be a symbol of power, could be a symbol of, uh, a, 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 um, symbol of territorial protection, we're not sure. 
Um, as is typical with these images, um, there is virtually no face. Um, as time goes on, uh, these images will have a face as shown below, uh, but generally they have no face. Um, this fellow um, is an infilled anthropomorph. He has um, extended ear apparatus. It's possible that this could be a female with hair whorls, which are the butterfly whorls that the Hopi wear. Um, we, have, we have quite a few images here on the Mesa that we can positively identify as females. This one is dubious. Um, also notice the, the, that this person just has uh, three digits to his, his or her hand. Um, we're not certain if this uh, represents um, uh, a Catholic um, iconography or what this is. Um, when, when one goes to the Native American dances today, um, one notices that the dancers carries a um, deciduous, um, excuse me, a conifer um, hand ornament that is placed in the, in the way of a, a trifoil figure in the hand. And we, we don't know why these are made like this. Big feet on this, pre, on this particular creature. This one over here um, not only has a face, but has a smile, has a single feather, again has a trifoil hand uh, representation. And this one, look at this, actually has toes. That's the detail that was lent to this figure. And this one down below is um, uh, a very large figure on this boulder. We don't have the um, photo board to compare to. A full face, including a nose. The arms are extended almost over the edge of the rock and an undefined hand and only has a torso, does not have the lower part of the body. This one I love, um, it's a very small image as you can see with the 30 centimeter board, um, but look how the maker has utilized the natural features in the rock to make the eyes um, the prominent feature on this image. This is a male. Uh, the males are more often depicted than the females are, but this is such a lovely image. This one is a little bit more abstract. It was recorded by the summer youth and uh, it would have been benefited if they used the photo shade so you could see it better. But you can see the drawing that there's actually this figure, the hands extended again with the three digits. And then in the background, and you can hardly see it on the rock, is a fainter identical feature. This one is more of a ceremonial type figure um, with a, a very, very large head, um, some kind of head adornment, possibly feathers, um, stylized arms and stylized feet. We have a category that says, um, that can categorize an image as a possible human. And I think this one possibly was categorized as a possible human, it's, it's quite, um, abstract. Then uh, this is another summer youth image of a, a partially infilled person, very nicely made proportionately. The has appears to have hands hanging down very close to the body, has, a, has, has no head adornment, but look at the circle that's been pecked around that. We have no idea what this means. Um, we have to remember and it's that we teach our recorders that we don't know what these mean. We weren't here when the maker uh, made these images. And so the categories that we use are very, very general and we try not to interpret. Um, I know there are a lot of people who do interpret petroglyphs, but it's the policy of our project that we don't, don't try to interpret. We try to be as objective as possible in describing them. Here is another with a single very large hand. The other arm seems to be resting on uh, the um, a person's hip. Then we have tracks. Um, these are elk tracks. Uh, they're so lovely. They're usually quite deep. This one happens to be in filled with lichen also, but you can see the track and also the dew claws. Um, but, you know, they're just so accurate. This one, um, we wondered if this is a bear track or if this is an abstract image. We don't know. 
I feel that this inner portion was added at a later time because you can notice that the repatination is much lighter than the, the lower curved line and that the, if these are toes. Here is a beautifully made human foot with five digits. Um, we have hands, human hands and feet that have six digits, four digits, three digits. Um, and we, we don't know if that is a genetic thing or accidental or why, but uh, you always make note of the number of digits that are found. This is a lovely, uh, quite old image. It could be late archaic um, that has uh, bird tracks. You can see a very deep, heavily repatinated one there, another one there that has scratching on it, an older one here, here, a, line, a dotted line here, another track. Um, these turkey tracks, bird tracks, are often used um, by the Native Americans to depict a trail. And we can identify a number of trails on the Mesa that turkey tracks or bird tracks are placed on rocks. And as the person goes up the route, may not be a clear trail, goes up the route, he's following a line of turkey tracks. We have one provenience on the far south Cook property that I think the recorders recorded 130 individual rocks with turkey tracks and leading on a trail, leading down to the um, Okeawenge um, over a quarter of a mile. It, it was just phenomenal. This beautiful image uh, was recorded by Linda and Ray and Allison and Lynn. This is just adjacent to the Elkwike mine. And um, just look at the detail of the concentric circles, so perfectly made. This wonderful two-horned serpent that looks like he almost has two eyes. I'm not sure if those are pecked or if those are natural rock figures. And then a very, very serpentine body that comes down to a rock feature here as though he is emerging from the rock. Here's another two-horned serpent emerging from this crack. He's not as carefully made as this one, but still a very nice image. Here's yet another two-horned serpent. Then we have this tailed disc, an infield disc with a long line that actually comes down and intersects the, her the serpent. What is that about? We have no way of knowing and we cannot guess. Here's another two-horned serpent, a little bit lighter. And then there are other images over here that you can see on the drawing. There's a circle and then a partial circle with a wavy line coming down from it. A very complicated rock, it's faced east. Um, it's very dominant where it is. Um, it's adjacent to an ancient trail. And uh, it just is a thrill to see this rock, to find it, to see it, and to record it. This is another one on the private property in the Ancone block. And um, this, I believe, is a shield. But look how beautifully that's made. Um, it's not that big. This is 30 centimeters. So this is probably only about 27 centimeters, about a third of a yard. Um, this is, um, we think that these represent feathers. We do not know. And then these lovely infilled discs. And then look over here. You have a one-fold ladder, which is really an archaic image, but this is not archaic. One can see from the repatination that it was made in roughly the same time period as this. A beautiful, beautiful image. This is when we had rain. <laughs> um, also the same property in the Ancone block. Um, a lovely image. Um, this is situated right over the road. Um, a, a serpent that I believe they did categorize as a two-horned serpent, even though the horns are not curved upwards. Very beautifully made. Another snake figure coiled up tight. A two-horned serpent down here coming across, going almost to the edge of the rock. A human figure, you can see right here, a human figure down in the corner, an infield heavily repat heavily pecked and repatinated disc. And then in a much later time, post-contact, someone applied an M, the letter M. Um, the Native Americans did not have an alphabet. We know that this is time specific in that it has to be post-1598. This is, I believe, the other side of that boulder. And look at these beautifully, beautifully crafted fingers. Each one has five digits. 
some of the hands, um, one can tell which is a right hand and which is a left hand. A beautiful snake, a circle with a curve over it, and then some more abstract images over here. Um, this, it was interesting in this provenience <clears throat> that the recorders um, observed and recorded what we call ritual pecking. We have a category called miscellaneous pecking in which someone's just pounding on the rock um, unintentionally. But look at how carefully placed and positioned these pecks are on these rocks. Um, this one has no other features on it other than the pecking. <clears throat> the same with this rock. Very purposeful, carefully spaced pecking. And then this beautiful rock with a, probably a shield has a full circle with two concentric circles inside, one of them being nucleated. <clears throat> this rock also has a very, very carefully crafted star. The star was very important to the Tewa people and it's thought to represent the planet Venus, <clears throat> which is just now finishing its, its um, existence in the Western sky. This particular star has a uh, nucleated in relief. There's an area there that is not pecked, which really accentuates the beauty. But this team, um, with a recording that they did of, these, of the ritual pecking, the property was about um, uh, 18 acres, and most of the boulders with the ritual pecking were found over here to the right um, in a drainage. They were clustered together. And so um, a drainage going down to the Rio Grande uh, means water. And um, this must have been a very, very special, perhaps ceremonial place for the makers of these images. And then you can see that there are other boulders along here with um, ritual pecking. Um, this one up here is located right down here low on the mesa, and again in, in kind of a pseudo drainage. The 124 and the 253 are located over here. 253 is way down on the south side. We have no idea what this means. Um, this is a lovely um, image that also is in the adjacent to the El Huique mine. Um, the team was thrilled when they found this. And um, Linda Ray, Allison, and Lynn Ray felt very strongly this is an ibis and went home and did some research. Um, she, she very carefully checked out the construction of, or the, the configuration of the beak, the head. It's a very, very beautiful, beautifully made water bird, carefully made tail feathers, um, articulated knees and the feet are a little bit less um, obvious. Beautiful image. So this is, um, uh, this is in the Ancon block. And you've seen some of these figures already with the two horned serpents. A two horned serpent down here, single a regular snake here, a one horned serpent here. And then there's this guy. And we have no idea, uh, we have no idea what this is. Is this a figure going along a track or a route? Is it a figure riding another figure? Is it a copulation figure? We have no idea what this is. It is so intriguing and pretty nondescript in this boulder, but not nondescript in thinking about what it possibly could be. Um, so but this is one of the treasures that we find working on the Mesa is finding images like this that really keep us thinking about what in the world this could be. Um, this is going back to that lovely um, figure with the shield and the in, infilled, uh, excuse me, the concentric circles inside. And here you can see a little bit better a uh, view of that star that's nucleated. See how carefully that's made, how beautifully even the edges of the star are. Um, it's not easy to make an image that perfect. So the next time period that we move to is the post-contact or historic cultural time period. And this is time specific because the Spanish arrived at the south end of the Mesa in 1598 and developed a community there. Um, we carry the date to 1969. This is a 
kind of a rough date and it moves around as time progresses. The table of people who were here at that time, of course, were likely to, to make the first images of features um, in the, that they observed in the Spanish culture. And then later on, both the Tewa and the Spanish um, made images representing um, what they saw with the Spanish culture. Um, so these are so time specific because these things did not exist in northern New Mexico prior to the coming of the Spanish in 1598. And it includes horses, donkeys, cattle, equestrian fingers, cowboys, bowler hats, oxen, carts, crosses, guns, churches. Later in the historic period, names and dates and initials appeared. Um, this, the names, dates, and initials represented education. And um, this was discouraged. Um, the, the church that was very prominent in this time period, the Catholic Church, discouraged education because that gave people power just as it does today. And so it wasn't until the probably 1856, I think is our, or 1870 is our earliest name um, engraved on the Mesa, a rock on the Mesa. These features are time specific and are related to what the Spanish introduced into the area. So here are two colonial anthropomorphs, I'm assuming they're a man and a woman. The, the woman has um, some kind of a dress on and the man uh, has pants on, the man has a bowler hat. We do not see the bowler hat until after 1598. These boulders are almost side by side. So this one is obviously a much better creation, much clearer creation than this one, but the concept is the same. These tend to be clustered on the Wells Preserve. Um, we have a lovely assemblage of colonial anthropomorphs and they're all um, created in a, in a very small area close together. This guy um, is just a very quickly sketched person. He has a full face, um, kind of dancing. Here we have some um, dates and initials or names. I believe that says 1913, FL, FM. It's not usual that these are so carefully made and deeply picked. Um, I believe the people in the early 1900s realized how difficult it was to actually make an image on these, um, on these rocks. These is actually superimposed over an earlier image of a tailed concentric circle. You can see that right there. Um, most of these um, dates, initials, and names are either abraded or, or scratched. Um, so here is one that was, this is also adjacent to the El Huique mine, and they were fairly close together. They were maybe, maybe 30 meters apart, but this Lewis star, uh, whoever made it, was very, um, very, very careful about creating what he wanted. And look how nicely this image just fits on this small rock. The star expands as the rock widens. It's a very, very nice image. And this one, um, I'm not sure if it wasn't finished, but it was very heavily, heavily uh, pounded, created, and also um, obviously a, a post contact. These are just images. Um, we're not sure if this, I'm not sure if this is post contact or perhaps a little bit earlier, but a curvature, an arc of dotted um, disks, all of them infilled a little bit with lichen. Look how bright this hand is. Um, it's uh, it's um, anatomically correct, but it's very, very bright. And so it's probably not that old. The same with this image in the lower right corner of what could be a canine. We're not real sure because it only has two legs, but it has what appears to be ears. Um, it could also be a bird. Um, we're not sure what that is. And then also a nice serpent. This is absolutely uh, concrete post-contact uh, iconography. This is a horse trotting. There were no horses prior to 1598. And this, um, I did some research on this. I think it's a sheep. Um, and I'm, I'm basing that on the square body and the head. And I did some research that sheep are born with a long tail and then that tail is cropped. 
um, for hygienic pur purposes. But uh, the research I did showed that the tail um, on a non-crop sheep actually comes down to the middle of their leg. It's quite, it's, it comes down to their hock. And so I think that this is a sheep, but I um, couldn't swear to it, but it is post contact. This one is an interesting one because it's an assemblage of several people making an image. Um, I suspect that the concentric circle occurred first, and then someone saw this crack in the rock and put this very heavily pecked line across and then added a rectangle and one extension. And we don't know if the intention was to make a human figure, but today it sure looks like a human figure. Um, and I believe that that is how the team recorded it. Um, this is in the Ancon block. Um, a very interesting image. Um, we do, when we're recording, if it's obvious to us that several portions of an image are made at a different time period, we make notes of that so that it will be put into our database. These are some abstract images. Um, we're not sure if these are outstretched hands, if they're antlers, we're not sure what they are, but just look how nicely crafted and balanced this little image is. And then this one I included because it has, you can see this jagged stair-stepped image. If this were inverted, it would be a possible indicator of ring, but uh, we very rarely see this. Um, configuration um, and it's very, very carefully made. And then if you continue to look at this folder, uh, there are a continuation of geometric Im images, a triangle, a circle, and an angled line. <clears throat> so um, crosses are the most frequent um, image that we find on the Mesa. Um, in about 2013, um, we had 3,000 that we had documented. And now I'm sure there's more than 4,000 individual cross images. Most of them are Latin crosses. Um, we've identified more than 25 styles of European crosses um, in our recording. In 2013, our then project director and archeologist, Janet McKenzie, presented a talk, uh, Cross Connections, Religious Iconography of the Historic Period, Mesa Prieta and Area at the International Federation of Rock Art Organizations that was held in Albuquerque, a big deal. Um, and she presented her research um, um, portraying that uh, she had identified at least 25 styles of European crosses. And these are some of them. This is a, we, are, we suspect is a cross on a building on probably a church, we, we don't know for sure, but that's, that's how we uh, categorize it. Here is the drawing care, carefully made. And ironically, our survey team um, was out last weekend and they found this cross that is just beautiful. Um, um, it's a St. John's cross sitting on either an altar or a church, I'm, we don't know which, but just look how beautifully that's made. It's very, it's very small, but uh, its impact is um, very clear. Here is a set of crosses that um, would be um, a set of Calvary crosses, three crosses set on either another cross or an altar. Very, very carefully and nicely made. This one, this, this is from our youth. I'm not, I'm not sure if these are crosses, if these are humans walking in a line or what they are very carefully craft, crafted, deeply pecked, and moderately repatinated. We're not real sure um, what this iconography represents. And then we have um, crosses and other Christian iconography. And these are singular um, images or features rather than a panel. Um, this one on the upper left is a St. John's cross. And even though it's not deeply, not fully impacked, you can clearly see the outline of this equilateral, beautifully made cross. The one on the upper right is um, probably a Maltese cross. Um, it has the extensions on three of the uh, axes and then a, a bit of an altar. And then the one in the middle could possibly be a chalice. 
Uh, again, we're not sure, but that was when the recorders saw it, they said, you know, that looks like a chalice. So uh, we don't know, uh, we, we can't prove what they are, but um, that's what we suspect and that's what we are able to put in our notes for our researchers. This is a boulder that is just phenomenal. Um, again, it's in adjacent to the mine area. Um, it's a big boulder um, and the features cover the entire top and then come down here on the side. Um, this is what the top looks like. And this is the drawing. And Ray was a, Ray Bourdain is a person who did the drawing. Um, and on this drawing, um, there were a lot of crosses. There were four Christian crosses, but they felt that there were at least six livestock brands uh, like this OA, running A, running A again. Is that a livestock brand? Um, we see a number of what could be livestock brands applied to the rocks. This one is a multi-element with life forms, one of the categories we have. And then um, they have a structure down here. But uh, this was a full day of recording to document this boulder. Um, it was, it's very, very extensive, but look what a very careful job she did. And then I have actually, this is her recording sheet with Ray and Linda Allison and Chet Chester was there um, all helping one person drawing and identifying and other people up on the rock walking through what all of these features are. So this is our recording sheet and we complete one of these for every single locus or every single boulder. But it has, we have the um, numbering and lettering system that works with our database. We have coordinates giving the location of where each uh, locus is, is located, number of photos that were taken, and they took six photos of this feature. Okay, then we move on to uh, a Euro-American time period. And again, this 1920 is a sliding date. Um, they're the most recent petroglyphs made on the Mesa. We don't call them graffiti, but give them their own time period or the American time period. Most are made with metal tools, which I'll show you is very distinctive. Some copy older Native American petroglyphs adding creative modifications. In the late 1930s, uh, the Depression Era Works Progress Administration or WPA workers also left their marks on the boulders and we'll show you one of those. <clears throat> These images can be assumed to be time specific when dates are included. So this is a WPA boulder, time period boulder. Uh, this is on the north end, northeast end of the Wells Preserve. Um, JVJ spent a lot of time engraving on the boulders because I believe we have about six of these. Some of them say WPA, others say 1938 JVJ. But look how precisely uh, this man or poor woman um, engraved his initials and the date. Um, and usually he chose I'm assuming it's a he, he chose a small boulder and pretty much completely filled the top. This was not recorded this year. I just wanted to put it in here uh, as an example. Here is an image that definitely has been made with a metal object. Can you see on this lizard, um, the incision marks, very clean cut incision marks. This was made with a chisel or a, a, some kind of a sharp edged metal tool to get these very clean lines here. And this one very likely was made with a metal tool also. These are very young, uh, they're very bright, they have very little repatination. They have some lichen in them that makes them a little bit darker, but they're very, very bright. So what do we record other than petroglyphs? We record what we call cultural landscape features. Um, these, are, these are the culture that the people who've used the Mesa uh, have left behind for us. Um, there are a lot of agricultural uh, features going back for hundreds of years, agricultural terraces, dams, gravel mulch fields, structures, watch rock walls, structures, shelters, reservoirs. And we actually find reservoirs that they may be silted in now, but the vegetation growing behind them is aberrant. 
Um, it's a higher water consumptive type of vegetation. And when one studies um, the area around it, one can see that uh, rocks have been placed to slow the flow of water. Ceramics and lithics, and I'll talk more about these. Trails of all time periods. Today, local people still use the old trails on the Mesa, often to visit the images of stories long ago told. Corrals, fences, lambing pens high on the Mesa reflect the important economic activities of sheep herding and cattle grazing that continued from the 1800s into the 1960s. Horseshoes worn out by horses and mules of herders and travelers on the Mesa are common, and we record those. Animal bones with signs of butchering and evidence of axe and saw cut wood harvesting are seen. We record axe cut trees. Uh, this is a little bit of a fuzzy photo because I blew it up so much, but this is another um, special feature that we find that we have named ceremonial pounding. Um, this boulder is it's a huge boulder with many, many images on it, but right here at the crown, um, the maker has taken a stone and pounded all of the patina off of this crown. We name it ceremonial pounding. Um, we have maybe 15 boulders with this feature out of how many boulders. And um, we, in talking with archaeologists, we feel confident in calling this a shrine because people have come back again and again to apply um, the features that are on the boulder. And cupules. Um, we have um, this, I, I, love, I love this picture because the cupules you can see are of different ages. These are very, very dark and probably are hundreds and hundreds of years old, whereas these are much younger. Here we have a grinding slick with a cupule in the center and then two more cupules to the side. These are all in the same provenience and fairly close together. And this one, this is a Tanaha, meaning it's a normal indentation or feature in the rock that in wet times will hold water. And you can see the mineralization of where the water was held inside of this Tanaha. And in addition to that, ceremonial appreciation was placed with all of these cupules. They're quite deep. They're filled, some of them are just filled with debris. But you can see the drawing here, the size of these cupules. So these are defined as humanly made depressions on rock surfaces that resemble the shape of an inverse cap or dome. <clears throat> They're made by direct percussion and then abrasion. Um, the percussion is with a handheld hammer stones and usually they're on vertical or horizontal slopes <coughs> or the rock surfaces. And then many of them have been abraded smooth. Cupules are widely believed to be the world's most common rock art motif, and they're found in huge numbers in every continent, on every continent except Antarctica. They were produced in many cultures from the lower Paleolithic to the 20th century. They are a very, very intriguing and exciting feature to find. This is a stone that um, Ray and Linda found um, that they don't know what the purpose of this was, but they knew that it had to have had some kind of a functional or ceremonial purpose. Um, very nice uh, display of side A, side B of this. It's fully polished, abraded. The ends have show um, indications of pounding. Um, what is it? We have no idea, but it was obviously something human made and uh, recorded by this team. Here is another beautiful image. This is a broken mono. Um, it is made of greenstone. And in this provenience where it was found, there were several examples of greenstone, some of them not altered by human use, but this one definitely was. This has been ground smooth on both sides, evidence of pounding all the way around. But look in the center here, this engraving of a bird track. Look at that. And then on the back side, there are scratch lines. And you can see the burnish. You can see the high um, intensity of usage on this stone. This is a very, very exciting find. Hello there. 
Um, this is a slab of Matati. Again, this is not from this year. This is another year, but I wanted to use it as an example. It's a small um, rock. You can see the 30 centimeter board pretty much fills it. You can see the depth of this Matati. Very, very smooth. It's out in the middle of a field, but interestingly in that field, we found gravel mulch beds, um, a known agricultural uh, field with a lot of terraces, a lot of agricultural activity, very high on the mesa. <clears throat> These are two projectile points. The one on the left is Petternal Church. The one on the right is Kelsedney. And um, the one on the left, unfortunately, is broken. Uh, the side notched one of Kelsedney is broken at the base also. In our studies, which I'll show you in a minute, of projectile points, the diagnostic portion of the point is this portion at the base. We don't have that. We are unable to date or type the, the petroglyph, I mean, the um, artifact. Um, <clears throat> we have recorded thousands and thousands of pieces of ceramics on the Mesa. Um, this is an assemblage and a typical manner in which the team would present this assemblage uh, for our database research. Um, the most important piece here is the rim piece, and I believe that's the rim piece right there. And uh, the team has drawn it. They've drawn the front, the back, the thickness, and they've indicated that it's a rim piece. This one is also a rim piece that has a notch here with probably a emphasis of more clay placed at the top for strength and or heat. And then look at the curvature on this. Um, the evidence that our teams are, are collecting is diagnostic and it's useful for researchers, uh, for those who want to come to the database to research ceramics. Um, most of our ceramics are biscuit, biscuit ware, uh, Tewa pottery, uh, biscuit A, biscuit B, and that was commonly made from 1350 to 1550. The characteristics are quite distinct from earlier pottery types. The pastes um, reflect the use of, of betonic, that's not right, um, clays and vitric tough temper. So looking, looking here, and we have a picture uh, looking at the temper um, that um, the researchers can look at. The shirts tend to break along a straight cleavage. We don't get many uh, irregularly broken shirts. They're usually quite straight at the edge where they've been broken. The slips um, are a very fine clay added to the surface or surfaces that were decorated. The biscuit A is painted on one side, the biscuit B is painted on both sides. Uh, most of the vessels that we're finding are, are bowls or jars. I suspect that more are bowls looking at the curvature of these bigger pieces. Um, and as I said, uh, the, the pieces that demonstrate curvature um, are diagnostic and very, very helpful. It's interesting, um, Allison and I are working up in La Canova towards the northern end of the Mesa. And we're finding biscuit ware, but we're also finding a lot of other types of ceramics um, that we are um, uh, consulting with experts about to see if we can determine about what time period they were made. As I mentioned, we cut axe, we, we record axe cut trees. We don't care about chainsaw cut trees, but um, you can see the irregular edges on these cedar stumps. Um, and this is part of our belief that everyone's history is on the Mesa. This is important cultural information. Trails, trails are everywhere on the Mesa from the base to the rim. Um, and you can see on this beautifully made trail that was in Provenient 50 low on the Mesa that the rocks have been moved to the side. Um, you can see the patination on this rock that it has been turned over. The lighter color would have been under the ground and not exposed to the air um, and to chemicals. The upper, the darker part was exposed to air and chemicals and became much darker. But you can see that this rock has been turned. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. So we can um, pretty safely say that this trail has had probably some post-contact usage. And we can pretty safely say that these may have been used for livestock. Um, we have a trail, and I don't know if it's this one or not, that has many, many ancestral Pueblo images next to it, which makes me guess 
that this was a trail that was used in ancestral Pueblo times and then had a repurposing when the um, post-contact times uh, to make it into a more a better defined trail perhaps for livestock to use. Again, we don't know, but um, that's the kind of information our teams collect. Um, Chester is moving our recording um, methodology into digital re recording, and we will be recording these trails on events and maps in the future. Right now we're doing uh, kind of a labor intensive uh, recording of um, taking a photo and a coordinate here, another one here, another one up here, and so that uh, those coordinates can be put into the database and um, show the area of the trails, but the events and maps use will make this much more efficient. This is also an old slide. This is a, a, um, a point that was found by Jenna Comstack in 2017 on the other side of the Mesa. Uh, she's an archaeologist and uh, she typed this, she took this, to, she did collect it with permission. No, she did not collect it. She took good pictures and took it to the lab for um, typing and um, used, you can see how many references we are using for typing these old image, these old um, projectile points. And her conclusion was that this is probably 2500 BCE. This is, this is middle archaic. Um, this point, it is a, she felt it was a San Rafael side notch Mokino concave base point, and it is Petternal Chert. So this is the kind of research we do um, when we find something that's very unique and very meaningful. We don't have the projectile point. We have all of this information, thanks to our recorders. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're constantly looking for evidence of Paleo-Indian culture on the Mesa. And this would be um, the late Pleistocene and early Holocene occupations in North America and encompasses the well-known Clovis and Folsom cultures. The Clovis points date to the early Paleo-Indian period, roughly 14,000 years ago. Um, the Clovis fluted points are named after the city of Clovis, where examples were found nearby in 1929. The Folsom complex dates to between 9,000 BC or 1,100 years ago. These points are typically medium to large lancelet points. <clears throat> so we have um, found uh, three possible examples of Paleo-Indian lithics have been found on the Mesa. We do not know if they were here for its prescribed purpose or if perhaps the later people found them and transported them here. There's no way of knowing this. These points are often repurposed. Um, we have no way of resolving this puzzle. So this is the first one, and this is found by Lynn Cravens, um, probably about 2012 um, excitement. Uh, we took this down to Dr. Bruce Huckle, who's a, a paleo Lithic specialist down at the University of New Mexico, and he gave us this information that you can read. Um, and his final statement was, we need a base for conclusive um, diagnosis. This, this point has diagnostic parallel um, diagonal lines. You don't see that on the later points. You can see that on both sides. It's of good size. Um, the width is uh, three and a half centimeters, and the height, I believe, is about six centimeters. It's a good sized half point. This we do have in our possession. This one we do not have in our possession. This was found by an archaeologist, T.G. Futch, who did a archaeological survey on the El Huique mine in 1999 for the Cook family, and uh, he was allowed to collect and keep the artifacts uh, that he found. This is a partial Folsom point. It's unfluted. It's a black fine grained basalt and it has a, a fracture. We can't see any detail on this very bad photo, um, but uh, he compared it with po other points um, that were about 10,000 BCE found in North America. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Futch has passed on and unfortunately his archeological um, collection has been disposed of. So we have no way of retrieving that. This one was found more recently. This was found by a recorder, Charlie Hersey, uh, coming down from the top of the Mesa on a rough route. Um, 
he picked it up and he wasn't real sure what it was, but um, fortunately he collected it, his team collected it. It's likely Pedernal Church, we're not real sure. We took this down to Dr. Um, Huckle also. And um, he felt, he, Dr. Huckle felt that this was likely broken during field use. There's percussive marks evident at the right side of the, of the broken tip. You can see these reverberating um, curved lines coming back. This would be a, con a typical concussion mark of a point that either hit bone or hit a rock. Um, this demonstrates that selective pressure flaking as a parallel oblique flaking coming across the entire point. The thickness and width are greater than archaic points, and this point is he described as robust. The ridge near the break is actually the top of a fluted channel, and the fluting goes upwards to the point and ends abruptly at the ridge. Dr. Huckle is fairly certain this is a tip of a Clovis point. However, he said he would not bet his paycheck on it, but uh, it made me very happy. If so, this point is dated to be 10,000 to 1300 BCE. It's phenomenal. Um, possible Paleo Indian rock images. This cupule is on the Wells Preserve on one of the trails. And um, Dr. Richard Ford um, feels that this very likely is Paleo. It's a very deep cupule. I, didn't, I don't have a size chart on it, but the interior of it is quite rough. Um, it's in an area with a lot of uh, archaic images, um, but uh, we feel there's a very good possibility that this is pre-archaic. This one, um, Allison found um, low on the mesa. This was a, a natural worked hole. And then look at these very, very darkly scratched lines radiating away from the hole. Um, the lines are heavily repatinated and scratched. Um, and uh, we're not sure, but we're wondering if this could represent, is that so? If, if this could represent um, paleo imagery. And then this is another one that's on another tour, on tour nine on the Wells Preserve. And uh, look at these scratches in a geometric manner. Um, that are heavily repatinated. We don't know, but we're looking. Mostly we don't know what we're looking for. So I want to thank um, our recorders and surveyors that worked in 2020. Not everybody was out for the full year, but uh, pre-COVID, um, everybody on this list worked during 2020 for at least a portion of the time. And I'm very, very grateful to all the very good work they did. And so we have a little thank you note here showing a good number of the recorders. You can show, see the terrain that we work in. It's not easy. Um, this particular one shows Margie and Rita down in a ravine um, recording archaic concentric circles. And then her, the third team member who didn't want to go down stayed and took the picture. We have mountain lions, we have birds, we have spiders, um, all kinds of um, critters. So, that concludes my talk, and I thank you for listening. And uh, we have time for a few questions if Chester wants to take it over. And uh, Chester, do you want me to stop sharing or do you want to leave this uh, slide up? Okay. Now the audience can hear me too. Uh, we have one comment so far. And uh, that's Diane Clark, who says, all this history from such a small place in the world, amazing presentation, many thanks from Oklahoma. Wow, thank you. And uh, that's really all that I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, if anyone has any questions, um, anyone at all, post them. Otherwise, if there are no more questions, then I think uh, we can probably we can probably sign off. Um, uh, any closing comments, Candy? Yes, I forgot. I didn't have a slide in here showing our website um, uh, URL. It is mesa prieta petroglyphs.org. 
and uh, we have a very comprehensive website. It's also interactive. And uh, once we begin to have activities again, one can go to the website, sign up for tours. Our other activities are, we'll be having fundraising activities, hopefully in the fall, uh, depending on what happens. Um, but that's, that's the way to access is, is through our website. Thank you, folks. And thank you, Candy, very much for your presentation and for all your hard work. Um, Paulo Lazar says, we are stunned. Wonderful images. <laughs> thank you, Paula. All right. So uh, thank you again, everyone. And um, sorry for uh, the technical difficulties, uh, kind of getting things started. And uh, But it seems like once we got going, it all ran great. And um, of course, once again, uh, thank you to Candy for not only putting together this presentation, but all your hard work throughout the year in, um, in coordinating the recording and uh, bringing in the data and, and looking through all this. So um, we very much appreciate all your efforts, um, including also coordinating with landowners. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. And for anyone out there in the audience interested in volunteering with Mesa Prieta, uh, we do have volunteer opportunities. Uh, right now, we don't have any more. Um, we, we have closed the rosters for our trainings for this year. Uh, but if you if you had signed up, uh, if, if I've already given you an email about that, otherwise consider volunteering with us next year. Uh, you'll get an opportunity to see such amazing things like you saw in this presentation. Um, I don't know off the top of my head who's uh, given the Mesa talk next month, but uh, that will be the last Wednesday of August, and we expect that one to be in person as well as online. So look out for announcements from that. And of course, uh, tune into my chat with the archaeologist live stream. We'll be back to the second Friday. Um, I was I was on vacation, so in July we did the third Friday, but uh, we'll be back to the second Friday for August. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, folks.